Hey, this is Buck from uh, Outdoor Access. Thank you for joining us for another Facebook Live. We are joined today by Cyrus Barrett from the Council to Advance Hunting and the Shooting Sports. And we're gonna be talking a lot about the kind of state of the union of where hunting is today. Um, but more importantly, talk about, have a productive conversation about what needs to happen to ensure hunting's future going forward. Um, one of the things I just wanna lay a couple of ground rules as we're going through all this is, this is really meant to be a productive conversation, not, <laughs> This is not the airing of grievances. This is not anybody in one particular type of hunting taking pot shots at another type. If anything, I hope that this conversation will help us to be able to see we're all in this one together. Like there is anything that, that threatens the future of hunting as a lifestyle and as a tradition affects all of us. So let's find some common ground. Let's have a productive conversation. And Cyrus, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Buck. Appreciate it. All right, so while we're getting started, why don't you tell us a little bit about your, how you got into hunting, you know, like a little bit about your background. Sure. Uh, I grew up right down the road in Glen Allen. I've uh, been hunting in Virginia for over 20 years, 20 plus years. Um, grew up hunting in Hanover and Goochland and Fluvanna and Louisa and down towards Sussex. And um, grew up hunting with my dad and, and a bunch of his friends. Um, so I mean, the outdoors is, is uh, firmly in my blood. Um, actually went to school to become a wildlife biologist uh, down at Clemson and uh, studied wildlife and fisheries biology there for four years and then uh, figured out I don't want to be a biologist. <laughs> so I took uh, kind of the, the knowledge that I obtained there and um, kind of my passion for grassroots advocacy and, yeah. and politics and um, basically went to DC. I, I worked for Ducks Unlimited for a little while, doing some campaign work for them in North Dakota and, and Tennessee. Um, then I worked for the uh, Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership in DC, working on public lands issues and um, some fisheries stuff and overall sportsman's policy. And now um, I'm one of the directors at the Council of Advanced Hunting and Shooting Sports. So I mean, we, we work day in and day out to make sure that hunting and shooting sports um, will still be uh, thriving and uh, not a thing of the past for generations to come and, and work to educate not only the public but uh, decision makers around the country the benefits that hunting and shooting not only bring to conservation but the overall GDP and, and um, you know the economic value that it brings to everywhere that you know there's hunters yeah and I think that's one of the things that people don't realize is that when we talk about hunting we're not just talking about a singular activity and sport the ripple effect yep. that hunting has on all wildlife and all conservation in the United yep. States are directly tied together yeah absolutely and, and um, you, you know it's, it's not hunters and target shooters and anglers kind of pounding their chest saying that we're the, the original conservationists because that's what they think that's that's a fact that it, it's um, you know, majority of wildlife conservation in this country is funded by the people who are hunting and target shooting and fishing day in and day out through license sales and through excise taxes. And, and um, you know, this is not a new thing. It dates back to the early 30s. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a concept that I think is so uniquely American that, you know, we were the ones who self-imposed this way of life for ourselves that we wanted to foot the bill for conservation that uh, everyone benefits from, but right. obviously it, it helps out our passions too. So let, let's help folks get a, a good kind of feel for what the State of the Union is right now in terms of, what do the numbers tell us? So <clears throat> it's not looking good. Uh, fishing is actually the number of participants around the country uh, who get on a pond or fish on the river in the past five or 10 years has actually increased a little bit, but um, some recent projections that uh, a project of ours that we just finished show that if you extrapolate some of those numbers out 10 or 15 years that um, it'll start to slide as well. Hunting is really where um, the bulk of the decline is, is taking place and um, you know in 1980 we had something hovering around 17 and a half million hunters. The United States Fish and Wildlife Service does a, an annual, well not annual survey, it's a survey every five years that tracks the number of hunting participants and fishing participants and wildlife watchers and um, a few times they've done shooting sports participants as well. Um, and so in 1980, those numbers showed that we had north of 17 million hunters across the US. Um, when that survey was conducted in 2016, and those results were subsequently um, released in uh, 2017, uh, it showed that we had uh, somewhere around 11 million hunters. So, uh, you know, if, that's, if hunting is a business, a business is 
tanking. Yeah, um, not doing well. Yeah, and um, so it, it's a it's a cause for concern, and, and um, you know it, it's not the chicken little syndrome, and, and I don't want to run around, and you don't want to run around saying the sky is falling, but um, you know in a time where the regulations have never been better for hunters, and the wildlife populations have never been higher, it's kind of head scratching that that more people aren't taking to the field yeah. every year. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things that I, I think, you know, we recognized when we started Outdoor Access yeah. was that there was this, it, it wasn't for lack of desire that people weren't getting out there, that what it was was just pure logistics. I don't, if I don't have a place to go, yep. there's no reason for me to buy a license or yep. be, be contributing to the cause yep. because the two, you know, you can't do one without the other. Yeah. And, and we're very blessed in this country to have an enormous yep. uh, public land system and uh, just have amazing resources, but those aren't for everyone. Yep. And so for the people that aren't looking for that or who aren't wealthy enough to be able to afford their own land, yep. there was kind of this huge chasm. And that's where we saw that there was this great opportunity and that it really was gonna take a, I know that a lot of people jump into calling us about commercialized hunting and everything. The, route, the fact of the matter is it was gonna take a business type of approach yep. in order to be able to, to solve that as opposed to a government or public entity type of approach. Yeah, I agree, and, and if you grew up out west, you know, basically west of the Mississippi where the bulk of America's public lands are, um, you may not have this problem. And you, 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 know, you could walk out your back, back door, uh, drive a couple of minutes and be surrounded by a million acres that open to you. Um, East of the Mississippi, the public lands is uh, a little a little bit dicier. There's not as much. Sure. The access might be harder to get to. They sure. may be crowded, um, and access is nothing if it's not quality access as well. So, uh, really commend you guys on, on the work that y'all are doing and, and providing people, um, you know, whether like you said, whether they choose to use you guys or, or you know partake in, in sure. the concept of outdoor access or anything like that, just providing that, you know, option for somebody. Who's you know may want to take their son or daughter or neighbor or something like that right. on a, a piece of property that you guys is in your system. And I think it's it's an awesome opportunity. Yeah, and actually that's one of the things we just recently introduced a new guest program that we are really excited to see that the majority of the of the reservations that we have coming in now, whereas in the first year it was just I'm going out by myself. Yep. It's now people taking other people with them, and I think that's a really vital part about keeping this traditional life, not just in terms of passing it along to the next generation, but getting new people exposed to it. Yeah, and, and fishing is a little easier. You know, you, somebody could probably walk into a Walmart or a Cabela's or a Bass Pro or something and buy a fishing rod and figure it out for the most part. Um, hunting is very hard and, yeah. and to do that. And traditionally, there's been a um, you know parental father figure, grandfather, uncle, or something like that, maybe even your mom, it doesn't really matter, but there's been somebody in your family or, or a close friend that has been your mentor, your access point into hunting and shooting. Right. Um, without that, the chances of somebody walking into Cabela's and trying Just to buy a license, out trying to buy way. a gun, trying to figure out which caliber of rifle to use, trying to figure out you know what shot selection for duck hunting, whatever, it's, it's, there's a lot to it. And so without that yeah. mentor aspect, um, it's very difficult to get into hunting, and so I think programs like the guys, the ones that you guys have done, and then um, you know a lot of the programs that the Virginia Department of Game and Fisheries is doing, and, right. and, and you know the the conservation sportsmen's groups around the country, National Wild Turkey Federation, Dex Unlimited, stuff like that, um, are doing to try to um, you know entice people to, to mentor people and, and right. you know incentivize taking a friend or taking a neighbor or taking somebody you know yeah so go out hunting this weekend and take somebody <laughs> with you or if i just saw kevin elliott say he's going fishing go out and take somebody fishing with you too yeah. so that's good um again if you just joined us this is buck robinson from outdoor access and i'm joined today by cyrus bear from the council to advance hunting and the shooting sports which is a mouthful in and of itself <laughs> but we're talking about the future of hunting and so let's use I, well, we just set the, the stage that the numbers speak for themselves, and there's no dancing around it. The, the numbers for, of hunters is in severe decline, and, and Cyrus rightfully said, if this was a business and you were looking at it from a business perspective, it would not be the kind of thing that a lot of people would say, that looks like a good investment. So now is the time before it gets too far down for us to be able to try and turn things around and really be able to and save our sports, save our lifestyles, save our traditions. 
So that yeah. said, let's talk about R3. What, first of all, what is R3? So R3 stands for, um, in a world that I'm in with uh, a million and one acronyms, it's just another one that right. gets thrown out there, but it stands for recruitment, retention, and reactivation. And um, it applies you know, not only to hunting and shooting, but fishing, participate, participation, boating, any outdoor recreation. And um, so let's take those R's one at a time. Re what does recruitment mean? Recruitment is basically what we were just talking about. It is, is literally going out and finding somebody to participate in, I'll just keep using hunting because that's what we focus on, hunting right. and shooting sports, is, is finding a way to tap into, whether it's a new audience segmentation or the next generation of hunters and recruiting them, physically recruiting them, getting them a gun in their hand or getting them you know, out in the field doing something. So that's that's the new blood. Yeah. That's taking people who otherwise maybe have never hunted or Correct. gotten out and done this and bringing them into the tent yes. as a new source of, of, of hunters. Yep. So retention is basically once you have those people hooked, right. keeping them happy. And whether that's, you know, if you're a state wildlife agency, if that's sending them an email two weeks before hunting season and say, hey, hunting season's coming up. Did you guys buy your license? If that's you guys, right. that's a month before hunting season comes up. Right. Hey, we've got all these properties that you can go shoot and get ready for the season. Right. And oh, by the way, hunting season starts in a month. Look at all these properties for deer that we have. Right. Um, so it's continuing to engage with those folks and making sure that they continue to participate and uh, buy hunting licenses and, and you know, just be in the hunting community. Right, and that's actually one of the things that, I mean, again, one of our impetus in forming outdoor access is that my understanding, and I've seen this not just in opinion, but I've seen it backed up, is that the number one reason why people give for, for not continuing to participate is they either don't have a place to go yeah. or they don't have a quality place to go. Yeah. They've looked at it and just said, what's the point of continuing to invest in this when I don't have a place to go and enjoy myself. And yeah, do it it's really hard to you know convince someone to spend you know upward of a thousand, two thousand dollars a year on gear and ammo and and fuel and food and stuff like that to hunt if they don't have a quality place to go. So yeah, it's always in the top three of reasons why people decide to not continue to hunt. So yeah. so we have somebody we've recruited them. We've made sure that they kind of stay in the pool. Right. Um, maybe they get out of it. You right. know, life events happen. You know. Kids go to college, people get married, they have kids. You know, some people put the shotgun down for 10 years or so, right. um, and then they want to get back into it. And so how do we get that lapsed hunter back into the pool? Right. And that's the reactiv reactivation part. Um, you know, my uncle is a perfect example. I, I think he probably hunted when he was my age, mm -hmm. had a kid and went through life and, and work and all that stuff. He didn't really get back into hunting until after he retired from work, right. and now he hunts more than my dad and I combined. <laughs> right. um, and so it's that's a, a big segment that I think a lot of people are starting to look at now is how do we, A, keep those participants in and happy, but then also how do we get those guys that maybe bought a hunting license two or three years ago right. who have lapsed back into hunting. Well, and so again, just using our platform as a kind of a microcosm yeah. of all three R's, I can tell you this. The three main segments of folks that utilize outdoor access, at least at this juncture, are people who are what I call a transplant or newbies to town, okay, and that includes active duty military folks who don't have any place else to go, don't have a network of connections, don't know where to even start to get that. And so essentially, even though those people may have been people that have hunted in the past, mm -hmm. they're newbies, they're new, yeah. and they're looking at it and saying, why should I buy a Virginia hunting license when I don't know anybody in Virginia and anywhere to go. So that's kind of our recruitment is bringing in people that otherwise say, I wouldn't do it because I don't have a place to do it. Yeah. And now giving it that. The retention part is again, a lot of people saying, I just lost my hunt lease. I just lost something like that. They might otherwise slip through the cracks and fall off, but we're giving them options. Yeah. And, and listen, we say it all the time. You may ultimately still want to get a hunt lease, but yeah. while you're looking for that next place that you something want to be able to, yeah, want. we have something that offers mm -hmm. you some variety, or if you have a great turkey track or a great deer track, but you want to go out and hunt some ducks, not every piece of property is going to support every yeah. type of wildlife, so we give that variety to be able to supplement that. Absolutely. And it keeps people in the game, right? Yeah. And then the third piece is, and, I, and these are actually some of my favorite stories, is that we get from land, uh, members who are talking about, I haven't done this in years. Yeah. 
and it was like an old muscle, right? Like they, <laughs> it was getting like that. First, it was a little painful getting out there, but now it feels so good yeah. to be back doing something that I always loved. I never yeah. lost the love for it. Yeah. I just lost the ability to go out and do it the way that I want to. Right? And we hear this all the time. It's like, I had a buddy, and that buddy, it was really easy, right? Like I could get on the property because he always was my kind of conduit. Yeah. And then he sold his farm. And then I was kind of like, okay, well, I just I'll hang it up. Yeah. And there's no reason to hang it up when you have so many different places to choose from now. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, wherever that would be a game changer. So we're talking about the future of hunting. And the, and this is something like, again, Cyrus's operation isn't going to fix it. Outdoor access on its own isn't going to fix it. It's our, all of our responsibility to try and fix that. And that comes back to, again, recruiting, which means getting new people out the field. If you, whether maybe you're older and you've already had taught your kids about hunting and whatnot, you have very valuable information and knowledge in your head. Go find an organization or some kids that would just like to be able to have yeah. somebody serve in that Absolutely. mentor role yep. and get them out in the woods. You know, we'll help you. It's free through our program. They get the kids to hunt for free. So we give you those opportunities to be able to help introduce that new generation or it doesn't even have to be kids. No, and in fact, a lot of a lot of the recruitment efforts around the country right now um, haven't really even been focusing on kids. I mean, the uh, it's still a major portion uh, for the most part of people. But you know, we need to continue to expand our reach right. and find new audiences. And you know, so like, who are some of those new? Like, where's a shining spot as far as new people? Or a new demographic yeah. that's coming into it. So, I mean, we're in Richmond right now, which is, uh, if most of the people uh, probably watching know Richmond, or if you don't, I mean, it, it, the food kind of scene here is, right. is really awesome right now. And um, there are some folks in Georgia who, uh, who work for the Quality Year Management Association and for the Georgia Wildlife Federation and a few other partners who have basically set up shop at farmers markets and Whole Foods and food co ops saying, look, you guys want free range, you know, organic, farm to table, whatever you want to call it, meat, right, right, right. buy a hunting license, buy a $13 hunting license, and you can kill, you know, this many deer, and that's this much meat that you can provide your family. Right. And so tapping into that audience, the local board movement has been great. Um, well, I think female hunters too. Yeah, that's that too, and, and just, uh, yeah, trying to diversify kind of our, our audience, because for the most part, you know, if you look at the average hunter, he's stale, pale, and male, right? He's, he's a he's a fifty five year old white. Oh my gosh! Man. I think we both made that. That's, that's scary. <laughs> and um, you know, so we need to make a more conscious effort to reach out to the single mother who maybe doesn't have somebody to take her son or daughter hunting or fishing, right. and say, look, well, if you want to get your kid into the outdoors, here's a way for you to do it. Or you know, just any of those audiences that are not normally tapped, I think we need to continue to reach out to them. Right. Well, that, you know, and that, again, this is all our responsibility, folks. Yeah. So if you have somebody, even they said I've never gone hunting before, that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity not only to get them out in the field. And here's the fact: whether they pull the trigger or they don't pull the trigger, getting them out in the woods is going to give them an appreciation for the outdoors that they might not otherwise have. Yeah. So getting them out there, hearing a turkey gobble, watching the sunrise, doing yeah. all that. That's still going to make them care about preserving and conserving that, you know, invaluable resource yep. that we have. And that's without, and I think that's one of the things that actually somebody was asking about is like, tie together, why is, why are hunting and conservation need to be mentioned in the same conversation? Um, and so we touched on it a little bit, but just to expand on it, the, the, the way that conservation is, is funded in this country for the most part. Um, is through the sale of hunting and fishing licenses through state agencies, so Virginia Department of Game and Land Fisheries. They make the bulk of their funding to pay for biologists and on the ground work and public land for people to hunt and fish. Um, they, they make that through when they sell hunting and fishing licenses and then they make it through uh, federal dollars that come back to them through the Pittman Robertson Act and the Dingle Johnson Act, which is basically, the Pittman Robertson Act is um, a piece of legislation that was enacted in 1937 that takes a t either a 10 or 11 percent excise tax off of firearms and ammunition and other things that um, only hunters would really buy or target shooters, right. um, archery equipment, anything that goes onto the the bow or, or certain pieces of the arrow, um, and all of those excise taxes get put into a large pot at the federal level through the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, and then that money is portioned out through a certain formula every year 
to all 50 state wildlife agencies. I mean, last year, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service gave out, it was like $797 million. Wow. So that's how much money is coming in through hunters and target shooters and anglers and boaters um, for conservation. And then these dollars are, you know, the, the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, while that may be the agency that you use to buy your hunting and fishing license, right. their main goal is the resource. Right. Right. They're, that's number one on the list of job duties is, is to protect the resource and conservation and wildlife habitat. And so while they may manage the wildlife for hunting and fishing, um, you know, they're doing conservation work that, that you know, positively affects non-game species as well. Every, right. every little songbird and, right. and, you know, turtle and red-eared slider and stuff like that. So, um, you know, with the decline of hunting comes the decline of hunting license sales, comes less people buying uh, excise tax equipment. Right. So it's less funding for conservation. So and it so creates this like downward it's, spiral. It's a vicious right? cycle yeah, that we so. get into that we, we need more people to pump money into. So it's, it's a really weird, uh, very uniquely American situation that we've gotten ourselves into. So. Well, and that's one of the things that like, I mean, again, a lot of people, and, and this is not meant to be like convincing everybody about how ours is just the only solution. We, we, we feel like we're part of a solution to yeah. be able to address some of these R3 issues that we're talking about. But the reality is that one of the things that we kind of address is this idea that, well, hunting opportunities can be available, but they're only available at a price tag that a very few number of people can afford. Right. And that just takes that exclusivity and takes it and makes it worse, not better. Yeah. And that's where we're really trying to come in. I mean, our average property rents for $20 a day. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, Pricing it in a way that yes, those dollars are vital to be able to keep the the you know the the whole ecosystem flush. Yeah. But at the same time, we want it to be something that everybody can enjoy, gets to yeah. enjoy, right? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So tell us a little bit about like you and I are both going to be at this R three symposium. Yep. What is that all about? So uh, the group that I work for, the council, um, as as well as several other organizations for the past year or so. Um, have been trying to basically bring everyone together to get on the same page. Like you said, um, as much as you guys may think it or want it, outdoor access is not going to solve the problem alone. No, of the course. Department of Game and Inland Fisheries is not going to solve the problem alone. NWTF is not going to solve the problem alone. Right. It's everyone needs to work in conjunction with each other and figure out what that group or entity does best and work you know, in conjunction with everybody else. And so. Um, we are hosting a the first ever national R3 symposium in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, less than two weeks from today, um, May 21st to the 24th. Uh, it's going to be a really, really exciting event. Uh, we're hovering right around 300 participants now from all over the country. We have representation from 40 or 41 out of the 50 state fish and wildlife agencies. We've got a number of federal agencies that are coming. Um, you know, you look at kind of the sponsor list on our website, and it's it's the big players around the country who care about hunting and fishing and conservation right. and our natural resources. And you know, it's folks like Bass Pro Shop and Cabela's. And you know, you look at the shooting sports side. We've got the National Shooting Sports Foundation, and um, you know, you look at the archery side. And we've got the Archery Trade Association and Boning Archery, and then we've got groups like Ducks Unlimited and National Wild Turkey Federation. Right. These are all groups that recognize that we have a problem on our hands and we need to come together to figure out a solution. We're not going to do it by ourselves. We have this shared feat yeah. that is all contingent upon yep. allowing people to continue to be able to get out there yep. and enjoy these traditions that are part of our country since its founding. Yep. And what we really need to be able to do is see not our differences, yeah. but our common shared fate, so Absolutely. to speak. And uh, yeah, so it's, this is going to be taking place in a couple of weeks. We're excited. Outdoor Access is going to be attending. Um, tell me about your website so that if people want to find out more about the council. Where do they go? So we're on social media at uh, thanks, the number four hunting, thanks for hunting. Uh, and then our website is just the, another acronym of our uh, full title, which is just cahss.org. You can just Google the Council of Advanced Hunting and Shooting Sports. It's the first website that pops up. We've got a lot of information on there, um, A, about the decline of hunting and the decline of shooting sports. We've got some projects that we've com completed over the last couple of years. Um, in fact, one that we'll be updating here very shortly with, um, in conjunction with the American Sport Fishing Association and Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation. Uh, and then we've got all the information about uh, the National R3 Symposium and 
um, you know, everything that you would want to know about it, we've got it right there. So it, 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 it's hopefully going forward your go-to source about hunting participation, shooting participation. How do I get in touch with the all 50 state fish and wildlife agencies? Where can I find a place to go hunt and shoot? And, and uh, so we, we want to be that resource for the whole country. And again, I want to just go back. The R3 is something that we all have to be thinking about all the time. So that's how are we recruiting new people to participate in these sports? Because we need them, we need new blood. And frankly, as you just said, we have to diversify. We have to make it appealing and approachable for a wider swath of folks, okay? So the, the person who's like, didn't grow up hunting, didn't yeah. have that exposure, this is a perfect opportunity to show them what they've been missing, yeah. all right? Two, we gotta retain the folks that are already in the boat with us. So if you see somebody or know somebody who's like, yeah, I'm thinking about giving it up, jump, why? Why, why are they, why? Bug him until he buys a hunting license again. Right, yeah. we, and we need to keep everybody who's already participating, participating, in fact, if anything, give them more opportunities to participate. And then for that person that you know, who, you know, and frankly, I know a lot of people say this, like, I, I'm tired of hearing you complain about how you don't go and do this anymore. Here, get out and do it. Take yeah. that person out with you. It's not too late to get them back in the boat again and be able to help that because we all need to work on this. This is not, as you said, a government uh, entity's no. responsibility. It's not private enterprise. It's all of us. But it's what it's our is, own problem that we've created. Right. And it's it's up to us to fix it. I mean, in, in the 1930s, when we were at the tail end of market hunting, when the Pittman-Robertson uh, Act was enacted, um, basically the sportsmen of that generation said, look, if we want future generations to be able to have the same benefits to hunting and shooting and fishing and conservation that we had, we need to do something about it. And that's how the Pittman Robertson Act and then a few years later the Dingle Johnson Act was founded. I think this is our PR and DJ. This is our chance for, you know, if you want your kids and grandkids to be able to have the same opportunities that you had growing up hunting and fishing around Virginia, around the country for that matter, that you need to, it, it's incumbent upon us to reach out to other folks, get them into hunting, get them into shooting. Um, at the very least, explain to them how hunting benefits them. You know, if, if you're a fan of clean air and clean water and, and you know, conservation and our general natural resources, right. you should thank hunting participation right. and, and fishermen and, and all that stuff. So I think this is our kind of, you know, big moment where we can either fail or flop. Or, right. or not fail or flop. It's, <laughs> oh, there's a we third can, option. <laughs> we, you know, we can we can kind of tackle this thing right. and and well, it's actually to turn it around. Yeah. I mean, honestly, we Absolutely. can start to turn it around. If if uh, if ten to fifteen percent of the active hunters and those are people who buy hunting licenses four or five out of five years in a row. Right. If they take one new person a year for just a few years, we'll reverse this trend and. Hunting will remain strong, and so will conservation funding. And as you know, as a result, conservation will remain strong in this country for years to come. Well, uh, we're going to be wrapping up in a second, but I just want to remind everyone: if you're not an Outdoor Access member, we would love to have you join. If you are an Outdoor Access member, we have a great program that we've launched this year at the request of our members. Frankly, we did we didn't do it simply because we thought it was a good idea. You told us you wanted us to create a guest program. And that guest program is addressing exactly what yep. Cyrus was talking about, which is giving you the opportunity to get more people, whether it's your family members, whether it's your friends, whether it's a neighbor, whether it's somebody you help coach the baseball team, I don't care. But get them out in the field with you, let them get out and see what this is all about. And the more that they experience it, yep. the more they understand the value of it. The more they understand the value of it, the more they're gonna wanna get involved in helping us protect it. And that's our responsibility is taking the responsibility that we have as individuals to get people engaged and to get people either back out in the field yep. or exposed to it for the first time. I hope that in a few years, you know, everybody likes to brag about, you know, the 160 inch deer that they killed or the strap of, of mallards that they killed or whatever. I hope in a couple of years that people start bragging about, I got four new people into hunting this year. Right. I took four people who have never been hunting, got them in the woods, they bought a hunting license, they were safe about it and stuff like that. You know, the, I know some people are like that. My dad is like that. He would much rather get somebody into hunting than to go kill a turkey himself. 
And I hope that we get more people like that right. in the future and bragging about that. Well, Cyrus, it's been awesome, dude. And listen, this is an ongoing conversation. <laughs> We're all in this together. Yeah. We hope it will come back again. I, I was going to say, I, I, I hope that you guys will have me back maybe after Absolutely. the symposium to do a, a, yep. you know, a post-doc kind of thing yep. and talk about what we learned there and, and uh, kind of where the state of the state of the whole community is and what everybody can do going forward. Yeah, I'm excited to see some other things that are happening around the country and be able to bring some of those ideas back yep. so that folks in Virginia and North Carolina and our members can benefit from things that are working in other parts yep. of the country. Absolutely. Cool. So. Thanks everybody for joining us for another Facebook Live and we look forward to seeing you out in the field. Thanks, Thanks guys. Care.